Coming up next, Book TV presents Afterwards, an hour-long program where we invite guest hosts to interview authors. This week, Harry Stein, author of How I Accidentally Joined the Vast Right-Wing Conspiracy and Found Inner Peace, discusses his latest book, I Can't Believe I'm Sitting Next to a Republican. Mr. Stein uses humor to explore the partisan divisions he sees in many aspects of U.S. society. Mr. Stein discusses his book with author and former Time Magazine writer and editor Stefan Kanfer. Welcome to Afterwards. I'm Stefan Kanfer, and normally I'm an author, but today I'm an interviewer, and I'm going to interview my fellow writer and a neighbor who lives about a football field away from me, and Harry Stein. Harry and I live in a very green, leafy suburb. You should remember that all authors lie, and all uh, commuters really lie, but it really is about a half an hour away from New York, 40 minutes at the most. It's a green, leafy suburb with ponds, sometimes in the summer, frogs leap underfoot, there's a little league team, it's a very calm and pleasant place, but it has a strange side that people don't acknowledge very much. And it's revealed in Harry Stein's title. So why don't you tell us the title and go from there? Well, the title of the book is I Can't Believe I'm Sitting Next to a Republican, which is what somebody said to me at a dinner party. Um, the, I'd been searching for a, for a title for this book, which is really about being a red state type, a conservative marooned in a blue state milieu. And this, it was a book about those kinds of people, people like us who are essentially despised by our neighbors. Well, you well, you encounter this because everyone assumes that you're a fellow liberal and that you have received wisdom that you get from where? Well, from the New York Times principally, but uh, you know, these things are handed down uh, and, 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 and assumed to be a given. I uh, started out as a liberal and was a liberal most of my life. Uh, and when I made that transition, I found that a lot of people I knew not only could not understand it, but were quite appalled. Uh, and I wanted to write about that situation, being really out of sync with one's milieu. Uh, and and I, I wanted to write about those environments, pla uh, places like New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, but also the pr professions where one is totally out of sync with everyone else such, in the profession. Uh, such as? What professions would you say? Well, uh, journalism, my own profession, Hollywood, social work. Uh, psychiatry, perhaps? Psychi psychiatry. Yeah. Uh, well, so tell me, what's, what happened? You said you were a liberal. Did you change, or did it change? Did the environment and the social condition change? Did politics change? I don't think I've changed terribly much. Take a, a, a subject like affirmative action. Uh, I mean, I grew up believing what Martin Luther King said, that a person should be judged by the content of his character, not by the color of his skin. Suddenly we found people were being judged almost exclusively uh, by the color of their skin. They were getting prerogatives, they were getting, getting uh, into, into schools, uh, they were getting, getting jobs on that basis alone, and it's quite appalling. So I uh, would argue that uh, this was unjust to other liberals and be regarded, as the, the word they use, as a fascist. Now, is this sort of promulgated by the academy as well as by uh, journalism? I mean, where do you turn in, in a place like this? Is everyone who believes, as you do, a pariah, pretty much, or not? Certainly in the academy, everyone who believes this, this is. But let me go get back to the, to the start of this book, the, uh -huh. your, your, the start of this question. I decided I wanted to write, write a book the, my initial thought was to call it Red Manhattan, uh, to be a red state type in a place like Manhattan. But red automatically connoted something Well, there were, actually, there were too many actual reds in Manhattan. Yeah. That was the problem. And I was really searching for a title. Uh, I, was look, I, I considered for a time uh, behind enemy lines, which is how we think about ourselves. I thought of uh, in deepest, darkest, um, among the savages in deepest, <laughs> darkest blue America. Uh, and uh, I was really struggling with this. And I happened to be at this dinner party. It was early on in uh, the campaign, the Obama-Hillary campaign. And uh, of course, everyone at the party loved either Obama or Hillary. Uh, 
And I made the mistake, and it is a mistake when you live in the kind of place that we do, of very tentatively raising some questions about Obama's experience and was he really qualified, you know, several years out of the Illinois State Senate to be the leader of the free world. And this guy turned on me, a guy I'd known all of 15 minutes, and exclaimed, I can't believe I'm sitting next to a Republican. Now, aside from everything else, it was inaccurate. I'm actually technically not a Republican. I'm, I'm still registered as a Democrat. But, you know, one finds that when you're a conservative in a blue milieu, people make all kinds of assumptions. They don't know very much about us. All they know about us is what they've learned from their media. We know everything about them because we're a watch in the New York Times. We can't avoid NPR. We can't avoid the network news. Uh, they don't know anything about us. What they know about us are the caricatures that are put forth in their media. Well, have you noticed something else that I've noticed, and that is that it's almost impossible to have a reasonable debate. In when I was in college, you were on a debating team. I made my statement. You, as the opposition, would make your statement. I would rebut. You would rebut. Now it seems to me it's all shouting down. It has and nothing name, to do with quality. quality. Absolutely right. Well, this was. You know, this, this is the, the second book of this kind that I've written. The first one was called uh, How I Accidentally Joined the Vast Right Wing Conspiracy and Found Inner Peace. And uh, I wrote that book really to have a dialogue with people uh, on the other side and to try to explain why I had changed, uh, the issues that motivated that change. Uh, and I expected the book to be, the book was very successful. I expected it to be read by a lot, by a lot of liberals. I don't think a single liberal, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating, I don't think a single liberal read that book. I think they saw the title, they knew I was, I was identified as a bad guy, and that was it. And when I say not a single person, I'm including friends, family, people who I'm very close to would not read the book. Do you, do you suppose it's like that on the other side as well? That those on the left only buy books on the left, those on the right only buy books on the right? So I think to a certain degree that's absolutely true, sure. I mean, look. I was not about to buy Al Franken. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to buy, you know, various uh, Bush bashing books. I, I, you know, I know what those people think. I thought I had something to impart that they were, were unfamiliar with. Uh, also, I thought the book was funny, as I think this one is funny. It was. It was very funny. But now with this book, you've uh, abandoned that idea of trying to change minds. That's very, very true. Then I actually write in this book that this book is only for people who agree with me already. All right. And, and it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's, there are a lot of us out there who feel very isolated, who, whether we're living in communities like, uh, like ours, our New, our New York suburb, suburb, which you described so, so beautifully, although I've never actually stepped on a frog, as apparently you have. Um, More than once. But, but also, uh, we're talking about middle America, where it's not that easy to find aid and comfort if you're on the right. Well, that, that's true, but uh, I mean, talking about people um, in, in, in areas like we live in. Um, well, that's even more so, but let's say San Francisco, but also, I think, to some extent, big cities where you won't find many uh, conservatives. No, you don't. I mean, w one of the interesting things is there are a lot more of us than, than is generally acknowledged. I well, mean, even you look at, I went and look at the, looked at the stats for the, for the past election, yes. the numbers. Yes, uh, the fact that voted. even Cambridge, Massachusetts, you know, you got five or six thousand people who voted for McCain. Now, presumably, every single one of these people is has been called a fascist at least once. Uh, but there are a lot of them out there. How about San Francisco, where you'd expect to find no Republicans, and there's still quite a few? Absolutely. I actually sat down with a, uh, I put together a roundtable of uh, San Francisco conservatives. It was actually hosted by a, a lovely guy, a gay couple actually. Um, who were talking about, uh, very amusingly, about how much harder it is to be uh, uh, conservative in a place like San Francisco than to be, than to be gay, There's a obviously. wonderful story in that book about a guy who wears a T-shirt, and the T-shirt, this is in San Francisco, says, war has never solved anything except fascism, communism, slavery, right. and, so and people see the T-shirt, and they just say, right on. <laughs>